As we record this, over half of Australia is back in lockdown and questions again are being raised around what the property market will look like once restrictions are lifted. Will it be business as usual? Will it take off even faster? Is there a looming COVID cliff after all? Welcome to The Elephant in the Room. This is the podcast where we love to talk about the big things in property that never usually get talked about. I'm Veronica Morgan, real estate agent, buyer's agent, co-host of Foxtel's Location, Location, Location Australia and author of Auction Ready. And I'm Chris Bates, mortgage broker. Before we get started, I need to let you know that nothing we say on here can be taken as personal advice. We always recommend you engage the services of a professional. Don't forget that you can access the transcript for this episode on the website as well as down Download our free full or forecast report, which experts can you trust to get it right? Theelephantintheroom.com.au Last March, when the entire country plunged into lockdown, there were a hell of a lot of doom and gloom predictions about property prices. And let's face it, a year ago, we had no precedent to guide us. Now, as Sydney faces the prospect of months of restrictions, we can look to our southern neighbours for a hint of what we're in for. Joining us today to discuss the aftermath of lockdowns in Melbourne on the property market is Jared McKay, buyer's agent and director of Wakeland's Property Advisory. We've met Jared before, way back in episode 42 where he gave us a bit of a tour of the Melbourne property market and shared the fundamentals of success down there. Thank you for joining us again today, Jared. Thanks, Veronica. Thanks, Chris. Jared, so good to have you on again, mate. I guess Melbourne's had a bit of a journey over the last 12, 18 months, but coming out of that lockdown sort of last year and you know going to this another lockdown, how would you just sort of describe the, the change and I guess the sentiment on the ground in Melbourne? It becomes second nature almost at the moment. It was very different last year and there was still a hell of a lot of uncertainty around when uh, I think it was the end of September and, and the start of October that uh, the restrictions were initially eased after our uh, sort of eight weeks really hard lockdown. Mm. So it was a bit of an easing out of things at that stage and, and people were, were coming out and, and having the ability to look at property. So it was a little bit softly, softly to start with. Right. But certainly as we got closer to Christmas, it really started to ramp up and, and we saw that there was quite a bit of energy there. And certainly by the time 2021 hit, yeah, buyers certainly hit the ground running and there was a lot of competition. Did you notice things a bit slowing down at all or was it all levels, you know, a lot of desperation in the market even in the last few weeks or prices have run a bit, people a little bit more picky? The interesting thing at the moment that we've noticed since not the current lockdown that we're in, but the the previous, so 4.0, which was sort of May, <laughs> May June. <laughs> so many to choose from. <laughs> that, one, that one was interesting because following that, uh, well, I mean, we've had really good supply in terms of numbers this year. There's been a lot of property for sale and Melbourne's very seasonal when it comes to its auction mm. numbers. And Typically, when you get into after the Queen's birthday, long weekend in June, things start to quieten off as you come towards the school holidays in uh, June, July, and then it's usually fairly quiet going into July, August. But this year was very different. We I looked at some numbers, obviously ignoring 2020 because it was a different market, but 2019, if you looked at the school holiday auction numbers, the first weekend... So if I looked at the three weekends of the school holidays plus the weekend after that, the first weekend had 450 auctions. The second weekend had about 380. The third had about 350 and the fourth went back up to about 450. This year, over those same four weekends, we had 1,500, 1,200, 1,300 and 1,200. Wow. Wow. That's spring numbers for Melbourne, um, getting those sorts of auction numbers. It's hu- it is huge. So it was really interesting to see that and see how the clearance rate held up and it, and it did still hold up fairly well through that period of time. So there was a number of reasons. I think vendors are still very confident that there's buyers around, so they're happy to put property on the market. But yeah. also there was a bit of the market compacting because they, people w- were pushing back campaigns that, that were meant to go in that late May, early June period and holding off if they could and so that there was an increase in stock levels in June that perhaps wouldn't normally have been there. But that's continued on. And even before this new lockdown kicked in, we were still – the projected numbers for the bulk of July were still expecting over a 1,000 auctions. So there's a lot of vendors still prepared to hit the market and normally they wouldn't be in the the cold, dreary months of winter in Melbourne. Mm. That's really, really interesting. And when you say the clearance rates have held up, what are the, where have they been sitting at? 
Earlier in the year, they were consistently around 80% or higher. They've probably consolidated a little bit, but they're still being consistently over 70%. I think we might have dropped below 70 once or twice. Mm. But even then, I mean, our view on the market down here has always been if you're in excess of 70%, we're in a, uh, a seller's market. Mm. Below 60%, we're a buyer's market. And anywhere between sort of 60 and 70 is fairly balanced. So yeah. mm. it's still very much a seller's market. You notice any major changes, like you know, in the buyer preferences, where people are coming to you and they're saying, you know, I want an investment or they want a home. They're, they're looking at different things than what they would have looked at, say, two years ago. I don't think, and I don't think this is likely to stay, but there hasn't probably been as much. Whether it's just been because they, it's out of sight, out of mind, almost, but there hasn't been as much conversation around public transport this year. Now, I think that's partly <laughs> to do with the fact that people aren't going anywhere and haven't had to use it. But I, I don't mm. think there's necessarily as it's not as much of a thing to be really, really close to it. It's still important and it always will be in Melbourne. So it's not to dismiss it at all, but it probably just hasn't been a, a strong topic of conversation. People are very mindful of having working at home environments, whether that be for children in terms of studying and things in lockdown and working from home from a school perspective, but also having some study space. So we've, we've certainly had that as a conversation a lot more as well. And those that are looking at perhaps more high density living, whether that be apartments or, or villa units, uh, probably putting a greater deal of focus on outdoor space as well. You know, it's funny. I, I was looking at some core logic data and noticing that Melbourne prices hadn't risen. They've been strong, but they haven't risen at the same sort of stratospheric levels as, say, Sydney or even Brisbane, and they're even a little behind Adelaide. And I guess that listings numbers, that volume that you're talking about, probably accounts for that in a way. But there's also a key difference between Sydney's lockdown and Melbourne's numerous lockdowns, and that is the definition of essential work. Mm. So real estate in Melbourne, absolutely ground to a halt, like everything else, right? Whereas in Sydney, we're still able to, one at a time, look at a property. I mean, obviously, that's had an impact on a pent-up supply. But do you think that would have made a difference to the recovery? I mean, how do you think that's sort of played out? I certainly think the supply has, the, the level of supply that we've got certainly impacts directly on the demand levels mm. because it means that it gets spaced out a little bit more. I, I guess if you look back over history too, from my understanding, Melbourne does tend to have, when if you're comparing Melbourne and Sydney directly, Melbourne probably tends to have a more consistent growth over an extended period of time, whereas Sydney has had a tendency to have significant spikes. Uh, that's what the Brisbaneans say. <laughs> Everyone <laughs> well, outside Sydney says that. It's hilarious. <laughs> I think I've, it does need to have a, there's some pretty big jumps that you've had over time, whereas Melbourne does, I mean, probably more so than Brisbane, but it has been fairly consistent. If you look back over the last 20, 25 years, it, it's it has had, had its ups and downs, but it's probably been a little bit more consistent over that period of time as as an upward trend. So I think it's probably more in terms of this current wave, I think it is partly to do with the supply and that mm. it gets knocked on the head fairly quickly when you can't go and look at anything. I've got a couple of vendor advisory clients at the moment who are ready to go and want to sell, but my advice to them at the moment is don't waste your money on advertising to a market that can't inspect your property. Mm. It's just not mm. going to be beneficial. So, And a lot of vendors have that mindset. There's no point in committing to something that is not going to get you the best result at the end of the day. That's common sense, isn't it? <laughs> So a lot of listings, do you think that that's a lot of home buyers listing to upgrade into sort of bigger places like the typical upgrader or is it a lot of investors trying to get out? What are you sort of finding? Is the quality of asset, you know, even though there's a lot of properties on the market, do you find the quality asset better or worse than, uh, than tradition? I think that's a really good point, Chris. I think the quality hasn't been the greatest this year. I don't think that there's been as decent quality stock. I think a lot of the buyers, I don't think it, in Melbourne, it's being driven by investors at the moment. It's very much around people looking to upgrade. They've been in there, spent a hell of a lot of time in their homes over the last 12 to yeah. 18 months and mm. realized the faults perhaps that it's got and decided that they do need to upgrade or perhaps even for some that have been looking to downsize, they've been echoing around in large homes that are beyond need, mm. needs these days. So are looking to do the downsize and have realized that if they are going to be spend more time at home, that perhaps rather than having a large home, they'd rather have a, a higher a quality or a more renovated yep. home, mm. it's going to meet the requirements better. Spence, well publicised has been a bit of an exodus out of Melbourne. You know, we've had clients who are wanting to escape, which is, you know, not really what traditionally Melbourne and Victoria has, has go, had it going for, a massive population growth and immigration and a lot of people didn't leave, even in state migration compared to, say, say Sydney. But 
are you finding a bit of an exodus in terms of, you know, let's say the, you know, the older generation wanting to go further north or young families looking to escape the city, going to the regions like, you know, the Geelongs or Mornington's, et cetera? Yeah, there's certainly been a lot of demand in the regional areas and looking to, to make that move. I think most of those that were looking to move into state have probably done that. I think that's probably mm. most of that has occurred, whereas the regional moves are, are still – because some people can't just pick up and move overnight. They they need to yeah. plan it, whether that's kids with school or whether it's jobs, that sort of thing. But there is still consistently – and from speaking to – I've got a – uh, my background is formerly in Ballarat, so I've got a lot of contacts in property up that way who I speak to still on a fairly regular basis. And the market up that way is still very, very strong. Yeah. Ballarat is very close to Melbourne. The train line's very good. So mm. from an accessibility perspective, it's good. You talk about Melbourne being cold, Ballarat's next level. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it does offer a lot of things. There's yeah. a lot of employment opportunities. There's some fantastic property there in terms of styles, fantastic education facilities as well. So it is a really good alternative for people and, and there is a lot of demand, both from young families, from people looking to just get out of Melbourne from a, a downsize perspective and looking just for a, a general change. I mean, you've got Dalesford mm. very close by as well. Yeah. So there's, um, there's a lot of opportunities there that, that people love to live that lifestyle too. It's funny though, I think, because the whole of Victoria gets locked down at a time, doesn't it? I mean, there's, there's very this, little. Well, this time they did. Not previously, they've there's been a tendency to to differentiate between metropolitan and regional. Mm. But this time, because there's been quite a number of cases in regional Victoria, I think it's just gone as far as Mildura. Mildura has always been yeah. the um, the case, the example of why do they keep getting locked down when they haven't had a case? But this time they have, mm. and so there hasn't been the differentiation this time. So. I, I still do, I mean, being from regional Victoria myself, I still do feel sorry for a lot of them in that there's just no risk in a lot of those areas or very, very minimal risk and they still mm. have to uh, suffer what, what we in, in metropolitan Melbourne are bringing on them. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think lockdown in the country is seen as preferable to lockdown the city for some people? <laughs> Oh, I think that it's it's you can do a lot more. Uh, you can get you can get outside. There's it's clearer air, but I think there's there's far you're far less likely to get locked down in in regional Victoria than you are in Melbourne. They might this this one's probably a little bit unusual, but generally yeah, you may get a week in regional Victoria and then it'll get eased, and so you'll be able to do a bit more. So that's probably why people are venturing that way. Can we go back to you talking about you know the quality of stock on the market and you were saying that it's not hasn't been that great and yet such huge volume. You know, you would think mm. amongst all that there'd, there'd be some good stuff. What do you think's sort of underlying that? Why why do you think that might be the case? Yeah, look, it's an interesting one I, and I can't probably put an exact finger on it, I, whether it's because it is a lot of the properties that are being upgraded. So it's people yeah. that are selling perhaps homes that they they, they found to, to not be as desirable Mm-hmm. And yeah. if they're not desirable to, to you, then they're probably not going to be desirable to someone else for the same reasons if you're looking to upgrade. So it may well be that, that perhaps that's why the stock is not meeting with the, the quality that you'd expect. But it's not unusual either when you do see large volumes that the, as a percentage, quite regularly, the quality is considered to be inferior. Yeah. Yes. You're noticing a big <laughs> construction boom going on there as well though, like the where you know a lot of people are renovating, I mean, it's definitely seeing that in Sydney, but are you noticing that in Melbourne? Certainly hard to get tradies at the moment, whether that's to do major works or whether it's to just do slight improvements to properties in terms of preparation for sale. Tradies are extremely busy, and even though they've in quite regularly during the lockdowns, they've been able to continue to work in differing levels and depending upon the property that they're working on, there's a lot of work going on. And so, a lot of people have, if they have found that their home is satisfactory in terms of location and space. Yeah. They're looking to do the extension, the renovation as opposed to moving. Mm. But if it is a case of, well, it's going to take another 12 or 18 months before we're able to get this work completed, perhaps we'd be better off just selling and moving on. Then that's the other consideration that people are looking at. Well, your stamp duty down there is enormous. Uh, you know, and, it's only you know it. and it's only increased again. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, when we're doing our budgets for clients, it's like uh, it's usually say 5% for stamp duty. I'm like, oh, no, it's in Victoria. Okay, let's go for six. Yep. Well, it's six and a half <laughs> over the top of the two mil now too. Yeah, wow. uh, which is adding up to a lot. There was a stamp duty 
saving up till 30 June, I think it's – do you reckon that had a bit of an impact on the market? I think it was only up to a mil up or something. Up to a mil, that's it? right. Yeah, so that yeah. was for anyone. It wasn't just for first home buyers. Yeah. And so I think that would have certainly helped upgraders in regional areas and helped to drive mm. that market because the median house price is typically not that strong. I mean, so I think that would have certainly helped there. But it would have also helped people moving out of metropolitan Melbourne into regional areas because, again, most of those properties would be under a million dollars. So we can take advantage of that and perhaps bring it forward given that we know that it's it's going to end on, on 30 June. So the typical sort of a young couple that are wanting to get a house, let's say, and they would have had a budget, say, let's just call it around a mil or low one millions, you know, but before they may have wanted to buy in, say, the Northcotts or Brunswick's or Yarraville or something, just a little cottage they could renovate. Are they that type of clientele? Are they looking at potentially going a bit further now and getting a four bed house on a bigger block than traditionally they would have just wanted a small cottage around the city? Depends on the mindset. Um, it's a fairly drastic change to go from just wanting a little, in terms of a lifestyle, to go from the, the little two bedroom cottage to going to the the family home in a in a middle ring suburb. So, but what we have seen is some of the double fronted properties in some of those northern areas around the the Brunswick's, Coburg, Preston, that type yep. of location. The double fronters over the years haven't necessarily had the same level of demand. People have probably looked at, if well, if we want the lifestyle, we're happy with something smaller and more renovated yeah. and looked at the single front. But if we want the bigger property, we'll go that little bit further out. Yep. Whereas they have put, there's been some really strong prices achieved for some of those houses very quickly in terms of changing the dynamic. And I think that sector of the market, along with a couple of others, but certainly that the housing market between a million and say probably 1.7, 1.8, maybe even 2 mil in those northern suburbs. I think that's probably been one of the strongest sectors within Melbourne this year. Yeah, it's the bigger suburb, bigger properties in those suburbs, which traditionally weren't that much more expensive, are really yep. that gap's widened. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, that's exactly right. So the, the gap, if you look at, say, some single fronted properties in Coburg, for instance, mm. and Bell, Bell Street can quite often be a bit of a boundary with, with Coburg if it runs right through it, but it can be a bit of a, well, I don't really want to go north of Bell Street, I'll keep south. And so the single fronted places south of Bell Street for a long time were seven, eight, nine hundred for a really good one. And now they're up at around 1, 1 1.1, but you could have got a double front for sort of 1, 1, 1, 2. Now Mm. some of the prices for double fronts in Coburg are up at 1, 5, 1, 6. Most of that's occurred this year. (laughs) It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, you look at sort of price data for the entire city, but then you can sort of really focus in on particular areas and see real leaps and bounds, can't you? Would you have said that that's because in a way they've sort of been slightly undervalued for a long time? I think so. I think what Chris said before is exactly right so for some of the double-fronted properties in those areas that they have been undervalued. Mm. Yeah. And the apartments though in Melbourne have, you know, it's a long-standing issue of more supply matching more demand and you've got investors and you know, no uh, foreign students, no immigration. Is anything really shifting in the apartment in terms of are people making those compromises, you know, because house prices are running on them or are you still finding people are willing to do whatever it takes to get a house rather than just buying an apartment? The apartment market's still pretty soft. Uh, it needs to have a, a fairly significant point of difference. And if it does, there's, there's, there is good demand for them. And we've seen some, some pretty good results for some of those apartments. But as a general rule, yeah, it's certainly not been anywhere near the, the strength or seen the same strength that the housing market has had. And that's for the exact reasons you've just said there, Chris, that it, there, there isn't the same demand from a tenancy perspective as well. So the rental market mm. has had a bit of an influence there in that a lot of the international students or even workers that come into Melbourne do typically stay in the city and, and do take up a lot of the tenancy demand for the high-rise type apartments, which has a flow-on effect to some of the old, better quality older style ones as well. But it's meant that the rental demand and the, and the rental dollars has certainly taken a hit and that hasn't recovered to the same extent yet. Whereas the housing market from a rental point of view, if it's not back where it was, it's not far off on a, on a value point of view. So that's that's meant that investors, even though there's some affordable options to be had, probably haven't mm. taken up the slack as you may have expected them to because they they find it hard to get a tenant for some, particularly for some of the modern apartments. 
And that was already, I mean, well publicised oversupply, you know, Melbourne's apartment oversupply situation has been the case. I mean, throughout the last boom, you had people losing money on properties, whereas the rest of Melbourne's going gangbusters, the rest of, you know, Sydney, et cetera. It, it sounds like there's no light at the end of the tunnel if you're left holding one of those sorts of properties. Certainly those modern ones, Veronica, you're not, yeah. it's really, it's really tough. Mm. And it's it's a case of well, do I just cut my losses and, and move on? Look, it's a case by case basis, and it's a, a financial decision that you need to make yourself. But from a property point of view, and those high rises, there's there's not a lot of scope there. Some of the older style apartments, I think, once uh, borders do open up and we get back to some form of normality, will will start to find their holding and 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 perform better than they have been. Mm. But it, it's it's probably at least at least I would say 12 months away before even the, the older style ones are going to really start to rebound. Yeah. One of the things that vendors in Sydney particularly are holding off because, of course, there's a real shortage of stock here and I'm talking pre-lockdown, uh, even <laughs> more so now, I guess, but um, there's a real shortage of stock. So one of the issues is, well, I, I don't, I'm not confident that I'm going to be able to find the property to upgrade yep. to or downsize to, and so therefore I'm not going to actually list my home until I found a property. So obviously there's a massive a bottleneck because of that. You're saying, though, that with the huge numbers, it was three times really what, by the sounds of it, prior to the lockdown, you had three times the sort of, stock volume you'd normally experience at this time of year. Do you think that people are quite comfortable to list without having bought? Is that is that something that's different? Um, I think it's a case by case basis on that. Uh, I don't, I mean, it's different people have different opinions and different positions that they need mm. to take. So look, if you can afford to buy first and find the right property and then sell, it really also, I guess, depends on the type of property that you're selling and the type of property yep. that you're buying. So <laughs> yep. if you're buying a property that's hard to come by and you're not sure how long it will take to find and you sell first and you have to then sit out of the market for six six months yeah. and watch it watch that gap continue to widen, then that's not not really what you want to do. But mm. if you're going to sell a property that again, let's just use those modern apartments as an example. And if that's yeah. what you're holding and you're you're looking to upgrade from that, well, it's not yeah. necessarily going to be a traditional four week campaign that's going to get you the price that you want. Chances mm. are if it's a private sale, it could be sitting there for a few months before you get the, the result that you'd be after. So I think the the types of properties that you're buying and selling really comes into that decision and the planning around what to do first. Do you think that most people realise that though? Because, you know, you and I know that. I mean, we all know that because we're professionals in this industry. It's like you, you basically do the yeah. thing that's most difficult first, you know, like just yeah. basically what you were just saying. But I don't – I wonder how many owners – I think that owners tend to think of – they sort of capsulate each part of the process. I think about selling and then I'll think about buying or I think about buying and now I think about selling. And I'm only asking about that mm. mainly because we've had a real problem with, with volume in Sydney really for the last five or six years. So we're, you know, our, our COVID volumes, if you like, are even tighter. Yep. And and I wonder whether it's just almost like you've just got to tip the balance. But basically if there's, if there's suddenly an influx of stock, which might happen after we're all out of lockdown and people have that confidence that there's more in the marketplace and that might just it's almost like a self-generating flywheel or so, you know what I mean? It's just self-perpetuating. Mm. And I'm just, I'm looking to Melbourne for some light in the end of our tunnel. <laughs> well, I think the supply side of things, I mean, typically you'll find if you're not sure and you're unsure about what you will or won't do and, and there's a degree of conservatism around your approach, then most people like the idea of selling first because mm. they know what they've then got. So yeah. Yeah. if I sell and I get a million dollars, well, then I know that I can go to 1.5 yeah. on the next property. That doesn't necessarily mean that's the right thing to do. No. Yeah. But that's that's typically people's mindset when they first come in and that's what I think I need to do. Well, then you need to work through the other options and why buying first may well be a better thing to do. But does that necessarily lead to more supply coming onto the market? Not necessarily. I agree with that. I think when we first chat to the upgrader, they naturally want to sell first because they want to know what they're going to get and it's not through an education process of how it's actually logistically going to work with buying first. Can they do it? Can they buy in a long settlement before they even want to consider? But most people want to sort of sell first. But I think you're right, Veronica, they don't sell because there's not 
enough properties on the market that they really sort of get enticed to think about selling and go, oh, that's actually nicer than what we've got. Maybe we should um, try to sell and buy something like that. <laughs> the return to work conversation around flexible work, I mean, Melbourne is a, a very much a service-driven economy, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, it, how's the attitudes around that? You guys went through a lot of lockdowns, a lot of work from home. Companies had to adopt to you know that arrangement. Do you think that it's going to be something that's going to stick around and people are going to be able to work from home two, three days a week or it's going to flip back into the power of the employer making sure you sit on that chair? I think there'll be a greater degree of flexibility around working from home than what there what there has been in the past. But one thing that we've certainly found is that there's been a, a real want to get back to work. And that's, I mean, I talk about that just from our team and from, from us working together is that people get sick of only talking to each other on 2D screens rather than actually being able to stand around the office and talk about property that we've seen and talk about strategies and get a really good understanding. And I mean, that's not just a property thing. That's a, uh, a working environment thing. So I think there will be greater degrees of flexibility, but we've, mm. we've found that a lot of people have wanted to get back into the office just to have that interaction. So maybe it's gone too far. So maybe the you know, people are like, well, actually, I don't really want to be working from home five days. This has been too much for me. When, when you get I locked want to down get as, back into the office. Yeah. When you get locked down as much as we have, that's yeah. typically what I think people get to that point and just say, look, well, it's it's great to work from home and the novelty was certainly there for a little while, but I think it, it gets to a point where, yeah, one or two days at home and, and, two, and three to four days in the office is probably a better balance. For others, it might be the reverse where three or four days from home and only one or two days in the office. Yeah. It really depends on the industry that you're in and uh, and how you work. If you like what you're hearing here, please share this episode with others you feel would benefit. And while you're at it, why not leave us an iTunes review? Five stars, please. Every review helps make it easier for other people to find us and hear what our amazing guests have to say. We love hearing your questions and we're planning more listener Q&A episodes. Please send your questions in. You can send them via the website, which is theelephantintheroom.com.au or directly via email to questions at theelephantintheroom.com.au. But Melbourne's a city city, right? It's like a hustle, bustle, yep. cafes, restaurants, you know, that sort of inner city vibe. It's not a sort of live around the beaches and uh, exercise, you know, that type of mentality. Do you think that plays into it a little bit as well? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the CBD is a, a good, a, a great area to be in, but there's a, there's a lot of um, small hubs around Melbourne yep. too that in terms of local retail strips and things. And the interesting thing in talking to even just a few small businesses, the cafes and things around where our office is and we're out in the eastern suburbs, yeah. I said to a couple of the, the coffee shop guys, "What? how have you found it? And they said, well, what we've lost on businesses not being here, we've made up for because it's a, a residential area as well with more people working from home and looking to come mm. out and have a break and get a coffee. So they've still made up for thing in, in other areas too. So- yeah, you know, I think it, look the met- the CBD is certainly doesn't have the vibe and, and certainly hasn't got the hustle and bustle back completely yet and didn't even when um, we were sort of April I think it was April May when we had a, a fairly clear run um, without any mm. cases <laughs> and uh, and it, it still didn't really get back to its full capacity. I think that's going to take some time before it does. And even that part of that is, again, you go back to opening the borders and things because there's, the a borders, lot of, exactly. there's a lot of international students that live in the city in those yeah. high-rise apartments and they're not there. Yeah. Mm. And the tourism, I mean, that's a, the Sydney CBD isn't hustle and bustle. You know, the regions and pop like, around the city is, but it's because there's no tourism, right? And that's where most of the tourism goes is to the, the centre of our middle. Yep. Yeah. Yep. The knock-on effect is interesting. I mean, we were talking to our local cafe owner today and because, of course, trades can't work, we've got a two-week construction shutdown here in Sydney and that actually is has a knock-on effect to, you know, smaller jobs around houses as well and renovations. And so they were saying that there are uh, customers dropped off remarkably i don't even think they realized how many tradies they had <laughs> coming yeah. you know getting coffees and and takeaways and whatever from them well tradies love to spend money on food they're doing spending a lot of energy right so <laughs> yeah. we've had tradies at our house for the last six months and uh yeah, they know how to eat and, uh, and buy stuff from the cafes it's uh they're a big part of the uh the local yeah local what's happening cafes. with your garden because you've had you've had basically being you know re-terraced all outside it's all 
ready to wash down the hill with the next rain? Well, no, that's all done. We're on the internals now, but yeah, this is the best opportunity I've had to record the podcast because there's no <laughs> hammering in the background. <laughs> Chris is always putting his, his mic on mute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you skip being delivered or something. So, yeah. Jared, and so with Melbourne and just sort of drawing some distinctions here, and of course, as of today, I mean, we're you know, maybe by the time we release this in a week or so, Adelaide will be back out of lockdown, but Adelaide's going back into lockdown. I mean, Northern Territory's been in lockdown, Perth's been in lockdown, Brizzy goes in and out of short lockdowns. But, you know, the construction has continued. Has that been the case in Melbourne? You know, particularly in the big lockdown last year, did construction continue? Yep. Yeah, construction did a lot of the way through last year. I mean, I, I remember from just locally from at home, there was a, a some townhouses being built and uh, nothing stopped there. They they were mm-hmm. still there every day and still kept the work churning through. So the interesting thing was there was another, and again, they all run into one another, but one of the earlier <laughs> ones that we had this year where it was only a short one, there was changes to, I think it was gardeners weren't allowed to, and that's the thing, it it hasn't been consistent, so sometimes to try and think back on what that one was and what the other one was <laughs> um, is hard to recall around tradesmen. But as a but generally, trades have been able to do most things, particularly on properties that are, are vacant. There hasn't been really any restrictions mm. as much there, but there has been some at different stages. But most of the time, they've been able to keep working. You're saying that in terms of that townhouse, it's one of the interesting things I find when I go to Melbourne and uh, see family in, say, the middle rings that, and I always sort of look at the road and I look at the street and look how many townhouses are getting built. There, there is a, a lot of in the middle and outer rings development going on and cutting up blocks, et cetera. Are you noticing that sort of still continuing and it's still a big part of the future supply of Melbourne? Yeah, huge amounts. It's still very much going on. And you're exactly right. It is the middle ring suburbs and the outer ring suburbs where there's more and more of them being built. And by no means to the same extent as apartments, but they certainly don't have a great deal of scarcity value to them in that there's there are so many. Yeah. And it is a, a fairly easy thing to do in some of the middle to outer ring suburbs if you've got a property that some type of mid-century brick veneer or weatherboard home constructed on it, yeah. chances are there's not going to be a huge amount of protection overlays on that. So to be able yeah. to demolish it and construct two or three townhouses depending upon the size of the block is not a not a really tough thing to do. I had a conversation with, again, some clients recently about that and they um, asked about in preparing a property for sale, should we get plans and permits approved? And I said to them, well, it's really not going to add any value. Plans and yeah. permits add value when they're hard to get and you're not really <laughs> going to be adding any value by spending the money on that. So don't don't worry about it. That's one of the things I notice when I'm talking to clients around those suburbs is just, you know, they'll say, oh, you know, there's a bit of development going on. So I'm like, well, it's probably not a good thing, right? Like you don't really want to buy a house in a street, come back five years um, later and the whole street is new townhouses, right? And you're the last house standing. That's um, exactly the reason that these people are looking to move because there's yeah. been too many townhouses built in and around the area and the congestion in the street in terms of parking and things is really hard because yeah. they might put a three-bedroom, two-bathroom on and the requirement for the council might be a double garage for off-street parking. But yeah. if it's a if it's a mature family that's moving in there, there could be four or five cars with the uh, with the house and as yeah. a result, the, the streets just get congested and that's what they found and that's part of the reason why they're looking for an alternative. Another thing in Melbourne is these sort of greenfield estates. I mean, I saw that Stockland bought a massive block of land in the north of Melbourne and I think it was, I can't remember the suburb, but they make all these amazing names for these new suburbs anyway. But, <laughs> you know, they're just all of a sudden it's a new suburb, a thousand homes. But, you know, we're talking 40 k's north and, you know, this just shows you the amount of stock that, you know, house and land packages that, are getting pre-planned, you know, like five, ten, ten years away. And so you just got to be very careful in these greenfield areas just because, you know, there's never going to be a shortage really in, in any type of investment life cycle. And so plus your new townhouses, plus your new apartments, they're sort of the areas that you don't buy, Jared, I assume. Yeah, look, the urban sprawl's massive in and around Melbourne. It, it just continues to yeah, go and go. Biggest city in the world. <laughs> yeah, it just continues out. And that, you're exactly right, though. As soon as demand even remotely gets anywhere near supply, there's another land release and off you go again. So, yeah, look, it, it, it's – and then the, the problem really with it is that is there the infrastructure around it to accommodate it? So the, the public transport – has to be continuously yeah. extended. But with Melbourne's public transport, it's it's like a spider web. It fans out as it goes. And so there's big gaps the further mm. out you go and big holes where public transport just doesn't exist. 
there's been like any um, surprises last year, like the Elthams or Belgrave or, you know, suburbs that maybe a little bit further out, like in the middle ring that have got big blocks surrounded by nature that, you know, typically people didn't want to move to, but then are like, wow, this is an amazing place to live. I, I can still get to the city. Have you, have you found like buyers willing to consider those type of areas? Ringwood East, I think I saw somewhere recently you had some pretty good growth. I was one, one, yeah. one of the CoreLogic releases had a, one of the larger changes to its median house price. I think they, they did quite well. But the bigger ones were probably more the regional areas mm. rather than the, the, the city fringe. Yeah. It was probably more the regional areas that had the, the greater jumps in prices. And a lot of those were probably outside the traditional hour and a half, two hour drive, because that's where bang for buck really took a, an extra step. So cities like, I think Warrnambool did quite well, and that's a, a bit of a distance from Melbourne, but mm. it's a, a fairly large regional city too. So employment opportunities and things are quite good. And the Geelongs of the world, I mean, we've had still had a, a, quite a few clients buy down there, but I guess it's just grown so strongly over the last, say, five years. Do you worry that as affordability starts to get stretched that, the, I guess, excitement or the desire to move to these locations starts to decrease? Again, the the Geelongs and things are, are interesting in that it's a little bit like, as you mentioned before, that urban sprawl, because if you go out onto the fringes of Geelong, there's a hell of a lot of land Absolutely. releases and estates and things. And particularly if you mm. go down towards the, the Bellarine Peninsula and Torquay and around Ocean Grove and those sorts of areas, there's a, a huge amount of estates that have been released down yep. there and, and a lot of house land packages that have been built. And look, there, there's the infrastructure's getting there with some of the houses and things that have been built and, and shopping facilities, that type of thing. But is a, there's a lot of land down there and the congestion to get out of there, to get into Geelong, if that's where employment is, or then to get through to Melbourne mm. can create some bottlenecks and things too. But look, Geelong, if you're in the city itself and, and sort of following principles around period style homes and close to Packenden Street or the city, those sorts yeah. of things, then it's shown some great levels of growth. And, and some of the gaps between the period homes in Geelong versus some of the even inner city period homes in Melbourne have closed in recent years too because there has been yeah. some, some fairly strong demand before COVID even in, in some of those regional cities. Yeah, so as yes, exactly. So that gap is getting smaller. So the benefit of moving to a different city to get that same type of property is no longer as, as enticing, I guess. And that discount has to be there because of, you know, the desire to potentially be in the city versus the regional in terms of the, the mass market. So do you think that as prices rise in these areas, that's going to lose a bit more steam and people are going to be back into the city a little bit more? Again, it depends on the, the mentality of the move in the first place. Yeah. So if, the, if the, the mentality is to just perhaps buy an investment property as opposed to making a lifestyle change, then mm. yeah, the, the regional areas may not be as attractive as perhaps what they once were. But from a, a lifestyle change point of view, if you're comparing a, a single front to a, a double front in Geelong, the gap m might not be as big, but if you're looking to make the change, and most people who do want to make the change yeah. are doing it for, for lifestyle and for size of home reasons as well. So mm. being able to afford a four-bedroom, two-bathroom home within a kilometre or two of your services, which you can potentially do in Geelong, you may not be able to do that and be reasonably yeah. close to the city of Melbourne. So the lifestyle probably still outweighs the smaller gap of, of cost. Are there other regional centres? Because when everyone talks about Ballarat and, and Geelong, are there other areas that are starting to really pick up? Mm. Bendigo's the other one. It's probably just that little bit further away. It's not significantly further than Ballarat, but it is a little bit. So, but that's probably the other one, and that's 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 quite good too. And then it's a matter of, well, how much further do you want to go? Because those three are within the two hours of Melbourne, so yeah. you've still got the proximity to the capital city. If you're going further, then you start to look out at perhaps going out to if you're going towards Gippsland, towards Bairnsdale, and that's significantly further. If you go up into the Wimmera, it's up towards Horsham, or if you go down into the uh, the Western District down on the coast, there you've got. Uh, Warnable, as I said before. So, uh, and then you can I'm go missing north. The big and, one, they were uh, Mornington sort of peninsula. Well, the, again, I, I, don't the don't I don't necessarily class that as a, a regional city. I, I, it's almost because it's proximity and things, it's, it's probably got more. And if you look at the lockdowns, it's been included within Melbourne's metropolitan area oh, most right. of the time as well. <laughs> so it probably, but it, again, it does give a great lifestyle change, but the, the difference in prices and things is probably not the same because yeah. it, it is a pretty yeah. pretty popular and well-regarded area as a holiday destination too. Are you finding anybody wanting to move to Melbourne from elsewhere? 
I think most of the movement around uh, or the, the property growth and price growth in Melbourne has been by Melbournians rather than, than regional areas, that sort of thing. So I don't think so at this point in time. I'd expect that to change though once uh, in, in a year or two's time. I mean, the, the fundamentals that make Melbourne a great city are still going to be there. Yeah. So once the lockdowns and things are under control and the virus to a degree is under some form of control and borders and things are opened up, I think the importance that Melbourne brings to Australia will, will still be there. And I think the lifestyle opportunities that it does offer will still mean that people will want to live here and it will yeah. still be a desirable location. Yeah, if you've got the Aussie Open and the F1, but uh, we'll wait and see. We'll see if we've still got and, it. Have you got a property Dumbo for us? I do. One of the things that I've been, I guess, one of the avoidable mistakes that we've been, and, and it's something that's probably come to light a lot this year, has been that urgency and that fear of missing out that a lot of buyers have, mm-hmm. particularly if they've missed out on a couple of properties. And mm. Submitting offers before auction and really doing it without a huge amount of insight and knowledge can be a very risky strategy and it's something that people are getting caught up in a lot at the moment. We had one recently whereby we had a a property that we were quite interested in for a client. It was an investor client and it was quoted initially at at 6 to 660. It was an Art Deco apartment. The quote was too low, but that's okay. They increased it halfway through the campaign to 660 to 720. And then someone decided that they'd like to put in an offer before auction. So it brought it all to a head. That person wasn't successful, but what it did was make the offer process go quite dark. This this company doesn't do a Zoom auction or a boardroom auction type process. It's just mm-hmm. highest and best. So what ended up happening was the, the person that had submitted an offer ended up paying well over 900. Now we were told that we were the underbidder and our offer was about a hundred grand less. Whoa. So by getting caught up in this, putting the offer, this is always the issue with putting an offer in before auction is that you mm. are going to run the risk of paying too much. And particularly if you are going to do it in a scenario where the agents decided that it will be a highest and best scenario, Mm. as opposed to allowing the transparency of having Mm. a Zoom or a boardroom auction. So if you want to submit it and there is going to be competition and they are going to do a Zoom auction, well, at least you can sit back and and then eyeball everyone and know that you've only paid one, two, maybe five or $10,000 more than everyone else. That wasn't the case with this one. That's a very interesting. I literally just in the last few days come across a number of different scenarios in pre-auction offers. Of course, we're you know in the online auction space yeah. currently, and you know I remember being a sales agent and the pre-auction is is really horrible for everybody. You know, nobody mm-hmm. comes off feeling very good, and I remember one of my colleagues you know, introducing me to their best and final offer process when I was a sales agent. I thought that's gold. That's what we're going to do. I'm going to create the rules and send that out to anyone who wants to play. And these are the terms. You give me your best and final by X and we're going to deal with the best offer. And that's it. You don't get a second bite of the cherry. And there were some times when all the offers had come in and they're quite close together. You yep. know, and there might be a couple of grand difference. That's it. And, you know, we're talking a good 15 or so years ago now. And the best difference I had was 26,000. I thought that was really good. You know, that was definitely better to do it that way than go to auction. But like, it's been a long time ago, Veronica. It was a long time ago. That property <laughs> sold in the 400s. <laughs> <laughs> ancient history. But but the principle is is an interesting one because sometimes it does flush out a ridiculous offer compared mm. to everything else and other times it doesn't. But as a buyer going into it, I know when I'm advising our clients, oh, God, here we go, this, you know, it's pre option yeah. whether we've set it off or whether somebody else has set it off, yeah, strap yourself in because this is not going to be fun. You know, you've got that transparent way where they run around, they just basically shop it around and they call everybody and they just keep going until the last person standing or this sudden death scenario and only afterwards if when they disclose the price and only the underbidder really knows the difference no Mm, one else knows they do i guess the only thing is that and you can as long as you're fully aware and fully able to set up your strategy around it so Mm. it's not to say that putting an offer in beforehand isn't valid there's certainly times where it can really work well particularly Mm. if you feel that the property has been significantly underquoted but in this instance do you go that hard i mean i'm always and the interesting thing is i'm always loathe with clients of ours on a buying side of things if it's a highest and best scenario to go to the absolute max that i would if 
I was able to sit and eyeball everyone yep. across from, across the table yep. from me. True, but then there's that risk of missing out if they oh. would have paid another ten. You know, and this that's yeah. the conversation you have to have with them, isn't that's it? Right. So it's and that's where really we had a client miss out last week by a thousand dollars, and deep down they wish they'd offered more. And mm. it was so we we'll have the conversation. It was you know late you know the night before. It was like, oh, what do I do? You know, we had a big chat and. You know, I always refer that, you know, this is the benefit of advisors, agent, having that internal knowledge, doing the pricing mm. for you, having these conversations, but they haven't got a buyer's agent. And yeah, they were a bit conservative and they missed out by a thousand bucks and they are regretting mm. it. But it was, it's that whole like thing you're talking about there, Jared. It's like, you know, you don't want to be, feel like you're losing in this transaction, but the focus goes a little bit away from trying to get yourself the price to, is it a good asset? Is it the right asset for yep. you? Are you still happy with that price if you paid a little bit more? Like unhappy with the price but super happy with you've got something. I mean, a client this morning, same situation, cracking property hits the market on the central coast. You know, it's great street. Everything's, you know, I said this property is going to be underquoted. It's like super desirable. Bang, first open, obviously a hell of a lot of interest. Monday morning, right, we're doing a best and final to tomorrow. What, what are you willing to offer? And then uh, we're doing the best and final tomorrow. And it's like, you know, so short time frame, 24 hours to get everything lined up and then make an offer. And, you know, it's just it's so hard for the buyer to know what to do, right? Yeah. Because like, they haven't – it's just a horrible situation. But you've got to play the game sometimes. And so you do. what is your advice, Jared, for that person who's getting thrown in the deep end there? What are you – what's your conversation sort of – protocol. Preparation is always key with anything to do with buying property. You've got to be organized and ready to go. When it comes to, to discussing figures along for, for something like that, you obviously have to come up with where value sits by looking at sales and market sentiment and all those sorts of things. But quite often when it gets down to the crux of it and, and trying to select a figure, I'll have a conversation with a client around rather than where do you want to buy it, where are you prepared to miss it? Yeah. So at what point does it get to the to the stage where if I tell you that this is what it's going to sell for, yeah, you're going to be disappointed because you've you've invested in this property, you really like it, it's what you wanted, but disappointment versus regret. So are you going to wake up like your clients have, Chris, tomorrow and say, gee, we should have gone further? Don't wake up and do that if it's within your budget. Mm. Yep. So look at it from a I would love to buy it for as little as possible. Yeah, absolutely. I want to buy it for as little as possible. But where are you prepared to miss it? That's exactly the conversation we have as well. It's it's not the time to play games, trying to second guess what other buyers are going to do. It's actually it it doesn't matter about any of that anymore. It's like we've done the pricing research. You know what your budget is. You know how uniquely this one suits your requirements or doesn't. Uh, and we've also discussed how good an asset it is. There's the four pillars that we look at when we're setting prices, and it's then it's a point at which the next morning, yeah, you do want to wake up. And it's the same with setting a, a limit for an auction. It's just that obviously in an auction, it's you get to uh, look around and see what's happening and who else is bidding. And this one, you've got to go blind and just, you know, deal with, that, mm. deal with that sick feeling that you have. But, you know, we've <laughs> we've got a situation literally today, and I can say this because it will be well and truly dusted by the time we go to air with this. But, you know, so this is a, a property that is, you know, it's got a fair amount of scarcity around it and we liked it for lots of reasons, but it also had some issues with Strata and, the agent was saying, no, 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 we're going to auction, going to auction, going to auction. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, no, get this surprise phone call tomorrow midday, best and final offers. Okay, what's what's your process? And, and you know, we'll be exchanging it straight away with the, with the best offer. And I said, okay, well, you're quoting 1.45. Clearly someone's given you an offer that's triggered this whole process. So what's your new high bar we have to clear? Oh no, best offers over 1.4. I'm like, hang on, you're going backwards. Like, <laughs> that's not the way this thing works. Like, you know, <laughs> if you were going, if you got an offer that was so good that basically you're going to now sell it prior to auction, just tell everyone what that offer is and, and everyone plays above that or they don't play. Oh no, 1.4. He'd absolutely refused to give any guidance beyond that. And I'm like, okay. And I just went back to my team and I went, well, this is one's a bit weird because normally at the moment we find that they're, they're boiling the frog, right? We're all in the pot and we're all basically the simmer the simmers on and then they just slightly turn up the heat and they start ratcheting up that quote and getting everyone to a certain level. But this one, we've all been chucked into a pot of boiling water. Like, you know, it's like, and anyway, 
midday, we've, we've submitted our offer in writing, you know, expecting it sort of five past, you know, you should be on the phone letting or, or at least emailing saying, no, you're unsuccessful or, or you are successful and we're going uh, to move ahead with you. We've heard nothing. We're recording this. It's only five o'clock in the afternoon. Still haven't heard. <laughs> I suspect they didn't have the interest. You know, there's some issues with Strider and I suspect maybe that spooked them and they've decided to try to uh, make this thing happen. So they're, yeah. they're half it's a half bait effort of doing it, and they've oh, good completely luck. yeah, exactly. So, and no one, <laughs> no, no offers have had to be issued on a contract. Mm. So it's not like they can just quickly exchange with someone, and then just no one will be any the wiser. This is, <laughs> I think, they're going to blow themselves out as potentially not having the interest that they thought they did have. I mean, I got a Dumbo today as well, actually. Client buying a place in Melbourne, looking to upgrade in the in a. Uh, you know, the, around the sort of St Kilda pocket yep. to Brighton, Elstonwick sort of area, buying before selling. So fall in love with this property, you know, last week, ask the agent for the contract. Uh, yeah, I'll send it to you. Monday comes around, ask the contract. I'll send it to you. Tuesday comes around, ask the contract. Mm-hmm. they send it to you. Auction is this weekend. They still haven't figured out how to, haven't got the contract ready. So our client is four days away from the auction, still hasn't seen the contract. Like, why would you list a property, run an auction campaign, uh, and risk losing buyers who are super emotional and ready to buy it without even having your contract ready to sell? Like, can yeah, you just- do that in Victoria? Would you- <laughs> no, you, I mean, the, quite regularly with the auction campaigns, the contract won't be available. I don't say ready, I say available <laughs> about until a week or two beforehand, but to be four days before beforehand and not have it, yeah, that, that's not normal. I just think, like, why wouldn't you, like, you know, if someone's hot and ready to buy your property and is willing to pay over the yeah. odds and they're asking for the contract and they want to make an offer and you're stuffing around, like, the next day they can wake up and say, you know what, what were we thinking? Yeah. Like, like you, you, the impulsivity in the property market is a massive component, yeah. like auctions and, you know, the desperation of FOMO. So, I don't know, I'm just shaking my head for my client, you know, because they need to make changes, negotiate a smaller deposit, potentially a longer settlement. Like when are we going to make those negotiations? Is it uh, Friday, 4 p.m.? Like, yeah, and then, they'll, and then there'll be complaints. Oh, we haven't got enough time to, to speak to this person about that. And no, we won't be able to change that. Well, yeah, who whose fault is that? <laughs> God. Awesome oh, uh, chatting dude. to you, Jared. I mean, Melbourne is, you know, one of the greatest cities in Australia or probably the world people think down there. But it's always interesting to see what's happening on the ground because it is usually a mirror image to what's sort of happening in Sydney. But I'd say Sydney's just been a little bit hotter recently. But maybe after this lockdown, it's going to flip the other way. Who knows? Yeah, look, I, I think expect to see Sydney, um, if it follows Melbourne, I don't think you'll you'll expect to see anything slow down anytime soon. I think as, uh, as soon as Vendors are able to um, feel confident to put their properties on the market and get the exposure they want. They'll uh, it'll continue on, and if you've you've got the buyer depth, which it seems as though you do, the market should continue on for at least the rest of this year. We are actually seeing that, to be honest. We've surprisingly in the last couple of weeks a lot of pre-approvals that conversations about clients. Right, you want to get pre-approved, but this is what we need to get going. And then it's crickets for a few months. You know, life takes over and no emails, sort of thing. And then bang in the last sort of two, three weeks of this lockdown, like people from, you know, January, February, March have just sent their docs in and like we're keen to get pre-approved. And I think this is what happened last year with the lockdowns with people got their ducks lined up, really wanted to, to go out into market. And then when things got opened up, way too many buyers, not enough properties. So, mm. yeah, I think this Well, I'm hoping we'll get more properties this time around because yeah. there's, there's the – the backup is uh, starting to build now that you can't get trades in to to fix things up and tart things up to put on the on the market. You can't mm. get it painted. You can't get your carpet. You can't do all that sort of stuff. I just looked at a property this, today that you know it's been trashed by tenants. It's actually fundamentally a pretty good property, but it's it's been neglected and it needs someone to come through and give it the big once over, and they can't. So it's going to sit there vacant. So that one may well sell, but if you you're living in it and you don't have to actually put it on the market, it's not empty, then a lot of people are going to wait. They can't get stylists in there to, to dress it up, you know. So I think mm. that's going to be one of the extra reasons why we might have a bit of pent-up supply in Sydney. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and also it's hard to list, right, because you want to present it in the best lights so mm. and you could see this. Yeah, can't can't list it because I can't get trades to paint it and yeah, et cetera. So, yeah, that's another thing that could make the supply versus demand things not be good for potential buyers. <laughs> 
Awesome to chat, Jared. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Jared. We want to make you a better elephant rider. And this week's elephant rider training is... I know that you've spoken a lot about this in the past and certainly Jared did too about the townhouse development in the middle ring of Melbourne. And there's suburbs in Sydney too where you can do that. You can, yeah. you know, the, the frontage is there you can, and the land size is big enough you can knock it down and put a duplex or, or even just in areas where you can knock down an old mid... You know, and often they are those mid-century homes that yeah. sort of then nothing sort of special. There's nothing sort of architecturally meritous about them, and they get knocked down, and some McMansion is put on them. And I think that where you know when I look at a suburb, say say in, in Sydney, a couple of examples. One is Willoughby in the North Shore. You've got part of Willoughby that's conservation area, and the other part that is not, where you can do this compliant development. And to be honest, long term, those areas that are conserved are better areas. You know, they generally, they they hold their value. They generally yeah. are much more desirable. And so it's, you know, if you can look at a suburb and can, you know, cut it down the middle and say, well, one's A, one's B, half's A and half's B, then you're going to buy in the A grade section of the suburb. So it's really important to understand the zoning when you're buying a property and you can find mm. this stuff out because nearly every council has this stuff available online. And you can get in there and you can get a real understanding of what is possible in the area. And a lot of people might, well, most people I don't think do it, but sometimes people do it because they're thinking about how they want to improve the property themselves. What can I do? Mm. But they're not necessarily thinking, but what could the neighbours do? Mm. And I think that that's a really important thing to do when you are looking at buying because you need to understand what can change around you. And there's one particular property very recently that I went to look at in Marrickville. And as soon as I got there, I realized I shouldn't have gone there. Like, you know, if I'd just looked at the map, I would never have gone and looked at this property. And mm. when I say this, it was one block back from, I think, Sydney Road. Oh, uh, yeah. And all along, you know, you'd see these old warehouses there. And it's like, well, they are going to get knocked down and turned yeah. into six story mm. apartment blocks, which is most yeah. of these areas and most of these roads are, are you know flanked by these apartment blocks and so i just knew immediately i wasn't we weren't going to be recommending that property it doesn't actually matter what's inside you yeah. know the actual house itself i don't care because Deal exactly for me over the and this was on the corner of the lane and so yeah. literally across the lane you you would one day have a six story apartment block now mm-hmm. i didn't even really didn't even follow it up until recently I was actually looking at some pricing research on another property in Marrickville and it came up just in the recent sales list. I was shocked at what it sold for. Yeah. Like, but what it sold for was it really blew me away and, and I really very much doubt that the buyer, ultimate buyer who bought that property would have even given it a moment's thought, whereas for me it's the first thing I noticed. Yeah, that's right. When clients will send properties to me and it's not, not a buyer's agent, I'm not saying that, but Sometimes I'll just, you know, play devil's advocate and come up with a few ideas for them. And that's the first thing I'm looking at. It's also, you know, if you're looking at properties and there's, you know, there's maybe people who know what they're doing or people who are pretending and know what they're doing, but the people at the back of the property walking up the lane and looking at the neighbours and (laughs) most of those probably don't know what they're doing, but, you know, know, usually it is a good thing to do, right? See what the neighbours are doing, you know, check out what potentially could change, what Mm. You know, who's gone up, who's gone out, who's gone, how could it affect your privacy or your light and, and things like that. And if it is an unknown, you need to factor that into your, your decision to buy because, you know, if that is not discounting the price and it's a big risk, yeah, you can easily shoot yourself in the foot. And if something easily, you know, all of a sudden a DA's is lodged, right, that person you're talking about in Marrickfield, bang, you've been discounted because that DA is online. Yeah. All the buyers are going to know about it in the area. But you could have avoided that pain by just thinking logically. It's a busy road. There are old warehouses that are probably not renting for that much. It's much more profitable to a developer to build townhouses and apartments. At some point, that's going to get capitalised on. So just got to sort of think these things through. I think in the current market, FOMO drives too many of, our, of the decisions and they're just, they're thinking now rather than tomorrow. So Yeah, I guess another part to it is a client sometimes, of, you know, there's places in the east, there's places um, in, you know, some suburbs, in premium suburbs where you can do, you know, new townhouses. And mm. if you are buying an older house in that area, some think, oh, well, I'll do it and then I'll do the development. I'll build a duplex. I'll live in <laughs> one. I'll rent out in the other. And yeah, that's great if you either are going to can afford to do the build because to do a duplex build is you know a million or two million or one point five million dollars of debt that you're going to have to be out of service plus your current debt and so you know sometimes I've had clients 
you know, come up with this idea of buying in this suburb, then doing the duplex and then renting one and living in the other. But logistically, how to actually make that happen, they haven't thought through. And so they've now just got an older house in a suburb that yeah. they can't afford to do the duplex. They can't, there's no point renovating it because it's better to do a duplex than renovate it. Mm. And you get stuck. And so if you, if you think, even if you think you can capitalize on these things, you've got to logistically think, how am I going to make it happen from a finance point of view? Yeah. And you got to live in it. You know, if, if it's unrenovated and there's no point throwing any money at renovating it, then you get a stuck living at home that's not that great. Yeah. And that's sometimes you'll see that as problems, right? Mm. Like some houses just are not worth throwing money on money on money because something's structurally or fundamentally wrong with the way the house is or located or something, right? Yeah, be very careful buying those ones. Please join us for our next episode. We're talking about a lot of elephants in this one. We're talking with Rob Broadhead. He's the CEO of 2020 Fire Protection. I've had a question in my mind niggling away at me for some time, and that is all around fire orders in apartment buildings. Why would one be issued? What's the responsibility of owners corporation to look after their buildings and provide adequate fire protection? What's the cost of doing so? And what are the risks of not doing so? And this is a very interesting conversation. And I have to say that if you own a property in an apartment building or you're thinking about owning a property in an apartment building, you do need to tune in. And even if you live in a house or own a house, there's a few things for you as well. If you're looking to buy your dream home or an investment property in Sydney's inner west, eastern suburbs or North Shore, my team and I can help you buy without regrets. Reach out via my website, gooddeeds.com.au. If you're looking to buy your first home, thinking of upgrading into a new one or purchasing an investment property anywhere in Australia, my team love to carefully guide you on this journey. And most importantly, get the finance right. Reach out via our website, wealthful.com.au. Thanks for joining us. We'd love to see you again. And remember, don't be a dumbo.